Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Neil Pandia. And I'm Nate Temple. And we're with Edis Research, and we'll talk about RFNOC accelerating the spectrum with the FPGA. So just a quick background about Edis Research. Uh, Edis Research was founded in 2004 by Matt Edis, and it was acquired by National Instruments in 2010. And it's located in Santa Clara in California. And Edis Research makes software-defined radios. Uh, they're divided into four different families, the B-series, the N, the X, and the E-series. And generally speaking, the B-series are radios that connect to the computer through USB. The N-series connect through Ethernet. The X-series connect through 10 gigabit Ethernet. And the ECUs are embedded radios. Turn it off. OK. Um, and so most radios, software-defined radios, connect to a computer directly. And all of the processing for the radio occurs on the CPU. And that's shown in this graph, in this uh, diagram at the bottom, where we have a flow graph running with a waterfall display. And all the calculations for that waterfall are being done on the CPU inside the laptop. And people have tried to accelerate this data flow and increase the throughput of applications like waterfalls and increase the data rates between the radio and the CPU. And one approach has been with the general purpose processor and SIMD instructions. So libraries like Volk in GNU Radio, if you've heard of Volk, Vector Optimized Library of Kernels. And so there are assembly language primitives that optimize the, the DSP processing on the CPU. And that effort's been very fruitful, but there's still more that, that would be uh, desired. And so the GPU has been used, and there's a program called Phosphor that we'll talk about in, in a minute that uses the GPU, but the GPU has its own set of limitations. Uh, it doesn't always match well to a lot of um, block-based SDR signal processing, and it carries with it a high latency penalty. And so the, C the GPU has had limited um, uh, applicability to general purpose SDR processing. And so th the other thought was to use the FPGA that's inside most of these radios. On the Edis Research radios, every radio has an FPGA inside of it. So the thought was, why don't we use the hardware to accelerate our processing? And so the FPGA on the, on the, on the radio performs all the high rate processing like up conversion and down conversion. And it's kind of the brains of the radio. It controls all of the ADCs and the DAC. It manages communication with the host computer. Um, and the code for the FPGA is open source. At Edis, the driver for the radio is open source, as well as the FPGA code. So everything is open source. It's hosted on Git, uh, on GitHub. It's written entirely in Verilog. Um, and these are the FPGAs used on some of the different USRPs. The older Gen 1, Gen 2 are some of the original USRPs from way back in the day. And they were much smaller. Uh, the Gen 3, E310, and X310 FPGAs are a lot larger. The X310 is the largest FPGA that we have, and it has a lot of space available for custom, uh, custom signal processing. And we use GNU Radio with the USRP, and we've integrated a way to use the FPGA and do FPGA processing uh, from within GNU Radio, and we'll talk about that. We'll go through an example to show the motivation for using the FPGA, and we'll look at Welch's algorithm for power spectrum estimation. And we'll look at an example where we have a USRP source block in the corner, and this is the GNU radio flow graph taken from GRC, and samples are coming in at 200 mega samples per second, and then being processed in that chain with an FFT uh, complex to magnitude, and then a moving average. All of that processing is being done in the host, and so, the host computer has to ingest samples at 200 mega sample per second, so 800 megabytes per second. It's a lot of, uh, it's a very high data rate. And then process those samples and do all of this math on every single uh, block that comes through. Some of the math in a lot of these algorithms can be parallelized. So in the case of the FFT, that's a natural choice to move to the FPGA. And so we may want to do that. The, the transport between the, the radio and the host is already pretty saturated. And the host is already spending a lot of CPU cycles ingesting those samples. And so we can alleviate some of the burden by moving some of the processing to the FPGA. In the case of a full rate 200 mega sample per second stream, that's 6.4 gigabits per second. Uh, processing and reducing the processing is one reason to use the FPGA, but there's another important reason, and that's latency. A lot of algorithms cannot be implemented, or at least cannot easily be implemented, using just host side processing. In 802.11, in Wi-Fi, you have the CFIS timings. In Bluetooth, you, you have some other uh, very 
uh, challenging response times, and you can't meet those where the, the samples have to go from the radio to the host, go through the whole stack in the kernel, and get processed by the application, and then come back out again. And so you have to use the FPGA for a lot of applications. So uh, it's not just throughput, but it's also latency. These are the different hosts, uh, sorry, the different uh, interfaces that the host computer can use to connect to the radio. And each has their own uh, limitation in terms of throughput. And the, even the fastest 10 gigabit link is limited to about 250 mega sample per second. And so if you saturate that link, the host will struggle to keep up with all the samples that are coming in. And even using a, a really wide link like 10 gig ethernet uh, may necessitate the use of the FPGA. And so since the radios have big FPGAs, and this one here pictured is the X310. It has the largest FPGA that we, uh, that we use on the radios. Why don't we use it? Well, it's, FPGA programming is difficult. It's very different fundamentally from uh, C or C++ or Python or host side processing. Has anyone programmed in Verilog or VHDL before? Are there any FP, uh, FPGA developers out there? OK. So I'm sure you'd agree that FPGA processing, FPGA programming is, is fundamentally different from the host. And not everyone is familiar with it, and there's a learning curve to, to get up to speed. Um, a lot of times when you have a design team, there's three domains. You have software experts who are experts at implementing something in, in Python or C++ and so on, GNU Radio perhaps. You have algorithm experts who might live in the MATLAB domain and focus on, on the math and the algorithm itself and the performance of the algorithm. And then you have FPGA experts who are, who are experts at fitting a design into an FPGA, meeting timing, and, and building uh, uh, hardware to do the task. And a lot of times those domain skills don't overlap. And so it's, uh, FPGA development can be hard and time consuming. And so the goal with RFNOC is to make FPGA acceleration more accessible. It aims to provide a way where you can write an RFNOC block to implement your logic, your functionality, and insert that into the framework and let the framework take care of all the glue logic and all the data uh, processing, all the data handling, the data flow, and integrate that into the host so that you can use the, the API, the API for the radio, to control and, and, uh, and operate your logic, your block. And in the past, the FPGAs were, were more monolithic and you'd have to look at the entire design and figure out where in the design to put uh, your code. But with RFNOC, the goal is that you can uh, use the framework to handle a lot of that plumbing for you and really just focus on your own application. Um, RFNOC is GPL and specifically LGPL. And so the modules that you write, you do not have an obligation to release the source code to those modules. It's fully integrated with GNU Radio, but you do not have to use GNU Radio. You can also use RFNOC from C++. So if you're not even using for, you know, GNU Radio for some reason, a lot of stacks don't use GNU Radio, like the cellular stacks, OpenBTS and SRS LTE and so on, uh, don't even use it. And so if you're not using it, that's fine. RFNOC can be used from C++ as well. This is what the architecture looks like. Um, at the bottom, you have the, the FPGA domain, and the dashed red line is the boundary between the host and the FPGA. On the FPGA, you have a Ethernet MAC interface, and this is the, the block that interfaces to the 10 or 1 gigabit Ethernet interface to your host computer. And then there's a crossbar. The crossbar is a packet-switched uh, crossbar, basically a switch, a network switch, which is where RFNOC gets its name, RF Network on Chip. And so packets of IQ samples are switched or are routed throughout the chip and through the crossbar. And from the crossbar, all of the blocks are connected. And whenever a block wants to talk to another block, pass samples to or from another block, or pass, uh, pass samples to the host computer, or receive samples from the host computer, it goes through the crossbar. There's a radio core block, which represents the interface to the transmit and receive chains, and takes care of all of the plumbing and all of the interface to the radio. And then there are these computation engines, or more commonly known as just RF knock blocks. And this is where you implement your logic, whatever that might be, of a turbid decoder or some other function. I just said that, that the uh, FPGA connects to the RF front end. It controls the, the functions of the radio. And the Ethernet interface is not just for Ethernet. There's also other interfaces supported as well, like uh, uh, PCI Express, uh, the RF knock block. Uh, is something that you can write or you can get from, from other sources. I'll, I'll, I'll review that in a minute. And the crossbar interconnects all of the devices on the uh, FPGA. 
On the host side, the UHD driver using the RFNOC framework uh, allows you to configure your block and use your block and provides an API to control and access your block from your C++ program or your GNU radio flow graph. And you can do that in C, C++, and Python, or, or in GNU radio, which under the hood is C++ and, and Python. So we'll look at an example of plotting spectrum. The radio core is now represented by that block in the top corner, the RFNOC radio block. Notice this is still GNU radio, but the block names have changed because you're now using blocks from the RFNOC library. And so that library provided by Edis Research, when you install it, uh, instantiates all these different blocks that are on the FPGA. It's a little hard to see, but the lines between the blocks now become green. And that indicates the data flow between blocks is on the FPGA and not on the host. And let's say we have the radio core sending samples onto the host, and so we have a RFNOC radio core block on the left, and then a dashed line. It's a little bit hard to see, but that, that arrow between the radio core block and the stream to vector block is dashed, indicating that the data flow is crossing a domain boundary. It's going from the FPGA to the host. And then the rest of the processing right now is on the host. And say we want to move the FFT to the FPGA to accelerate it. And so we replace that FFT block that's uh, uh, being run on the host with an RFNOC FFT block. And notice the arrow between the RFNOC radio core block and the FFT block is now green. Again, to indicate the data flow is on the FPGA. And so now we have an FFT block, and the data flow would look like this. The radio core receives samples. The samples go to the crossbar. They're routed to the desired block, in this case, the FFT block. And then the FFT block performs its, its function, its FFT, and sends those samples out back to the crossbar, and they're routed to their destination, which in this case, is the host computer. And the rest of the processing in the chain, in the flow graph, occurs on the host computer. If you want to move additional functions to the FPGA, like the logarithm or whatnot in this, in this flow graph, you can do that and add additional uh, RF knock blocks. This is what the, R, the blocks look like when you zoom in a little bit closer. All of the, the communication between blocks is packetized. And so there's a packetizer and a depacketizer in every block. And all of those, those modules in green are provided by the RFNOC framework. You don't have to write those. And so there's a packetizer and depacketizer to packetize IQ data, sample data from the radio uh, across the crossbar. And there's a FIFO for flow control. Um, the FIFO also serves another purpose uh, for clock domain crossings. I'll talk about that in just a second. And then there's a TX interface and an RX interface that controls communication with the rest of the radio. And in the example from before, from the previous slide, samples are coming into the radio core block and being received. They go to the crossbar, and then they come into the FFT block where they're depacketized. Again, there's a FIFO for flow control. And then they go to the, to the FFT itself, which is in the pink box. And that can come from any source. You could write that yourself. It could come from Xilinx. You could get it from opencores.org or, or wherever. And the only requirement on your logic is that it uses AXI streams. And there's a slide coming up where I'll go um, in a little bit more detail about AXI, but it's an industry standard for a point-to-point -point link between modules. And um, most IP out there, third-party IP, like from Xilinx, supports AXI. So as long as your IP speaks AXI, if you would, you can insert that IP into the RFNOC block uh, in the pink box here and connect it to the rest of the framework. And uh, I said that about uh, these, these footnotes here I already said. And uh, where do you get this IP? Let me fast forward for a minute. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll not fast forward. Um, and let me go to a different example. So we'll look at a cognitive radio example. This is, this is a hypothetical example where we want to do some cognitive radio and control a lot of it from the FPGA, not just from the host. And so the radio core perhaps is receiving samples, and that goes to the FFT block, which comes from, say, Xilinx. Uh, an FFT is calculated, and that spectrum uh, is sent to the spectrum policy block, which could be some kind of soft processor or some other kind of logic that maybe looks for energy in a bin or some other criteria to determine that something is happening in the spectrum that we're interested in. And then when that happens, a trigger is sent to the TX modulator block. And when that block sees the trigger, it downloads or it receives, uh, it, 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 it requests a payload from the host computer for samples to be transmitted, and it goes and transmits those. Um, so this is an example of RFNOC, um, an application of RFNOC. And notice that all the blocks, all the RFNOC blocks that are added in orange, 
don't have to come from the same source. In one case, in this example, they're coming from Xilinx. Uh, in another case, they might be coming from Vivado HLS, uh, I'll talk about in a moment. Or they could be something that you wrote yourself or you, or you took from opencores.org. Uh, the blocks can come from all these different sources. Like I said, you can use the built-in Edis Research Library. When you install RFNOC, there's a couple of blocks that come with RFNOC. I think there's about 14 or so right now. Uh, and they, they support all the common DSP functions like FFTs and Windows. There's a SIGGEN block. There's a bunch of blocks that come with the framework. You can, of course, write your own in Verilog or VHDL. Most of the tools are dual language tools these days. So you can use either language. You can use opencores.org, which is an open source repository for hardware, and um, uh, obtain a block from there. You can use third party IP from Xilinx. Uh, you can use Vivado HLS, which is a tool that will generate a, uh, Verilog and VHDL from a C++ module. So if you're not interested in, in, in coding C++, or, or sorry, Verilog VHDL from scratch, you can use that tool to generate the Verilog and VHDL from a C++ module. There was a challenge that we ran last year uh, with Xilinx, and three teams were selected, and they, their code is available on GitHub. So if you're thinking about using Vivado, you may want to look at their code. Uh, it's all posted on GitHub, and they, I don't remember all of the three projects. I think one was ATSC decoder, but they implemented three different systems using Vivado HLS, and so there's C++ modules that, that generated RFNOC blocks. And there's also HDL coder from the MathWorks where you can take M files or Simulink models and generate Verilog and VHDL from that. When you build the FPGA uh, for use with RFNOC, um, there's a couple of tool chains. The older radios use uh, ISE, and those radios don't support RFNOC. RFNOC is only supported on the E series, the, the X series, the X310, and the N310, N300. And they use Vivado, which is the current tool chain that, that Xilinx supports. Um, if you're using the E310 or E312, you actually can use the free Webpack edition, and so you don't need a, a license. You still need a license file, but it doesn't cost anything. But the newer, uh, the, the larger FPGAs in the X and N series, N300 series, uh, do require a paid license. And you would, you would you install Xilinx. Once you had Xilinx installed, you would build an FPGA from the command line. We, we provide make files in the UHD repository when you, when you install RFNOC and you invoke the build process from the command line. There is an optional GUI, as you see in the bottom of the slide. There's an optional GUI that you can invoke. And the GUI is basically a wrapper for the command line. So you can use the GUI to click through and select what target you'd like, what, what blocks you want to add to your design, and then go and build a, a design. This is what the GUI tool looks like. You select a target on the left. You provide some edits blocks uh, in the middle. You bring them over to the right side to, to show all the blocks that are in your design. And then you uh, generate the bit file. You generate um, the FPGA image. And it'll show you the command line that it's going to use to generate that. And you can take that command line and copy paste it into a script uh, or invoke it manually on the command line if you prefer. Or the tool can just invoke it directly. The, the GUI tool can invoke it directly. And with that, I'm gonna, we'll talk next about Foster, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Nate. So many of you are probably uh, familiar with uh, an out of tree module for the GNU radio toolkit called GR Phosphor. It's uh, one of the, it's an emulation of an RTSA like spectrum visual <coughs> visualization. GR Phosphor. <laughs> Originally, GR Phosphor was designed to run on a GPU uh, using OpenCL and OpenGL for acceleration. It's great for uh, fast signals, and if we look at the demo that we have running here, it's uh, we're looking at Wi-Fi and Bluetooth there, so really short intervals. There's also an RF knock variant. Now, this the what's running is the RF knock variant. Uh, it was created by Sylvain Munant. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at TNT, in the, on the Osmocom uh, wiki pages, and along with a, an additional video demo of Phosphor. So this is a GPU Phosphor, which you're probably familiar with. Um, this is running with a B200. So I'm looking at 50 mega samples, uh, 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth at a given time. On the left here, this is a bunch of push to talk traffic, police, fire, EMS, type uh, you know, business radio type stuff. Then we'll see uh, LTE 
various LT channels along with a pair of uh, WCDMA channels there. Now, this is all being processed on the host. So the CPU has to bring in the samples and shuffle them off to the GPU where then the FFT and processing is done, which can be uh, challenging. It works for 50 mega samples, like a, the new NVIDIA's 980s will do 400 mega samples or so uh, through them. But, and one point to make, the data transport rate across to, from the radio to the host, host is 1.8 or 1.6 gigabits per second at 50 mega samples. This is also a 50 megahertz view of the same center frequency. However, now this is the RF knock version. Instead of running at 1.6 gigabits per second, the transport rate from the radio until to the computer is around four megabits. So it's incredibly, uh, an incredible reduction in the bandwidth that's required for that. One interesting note I wanna make about this screenshot, kind of a little historical neat thing. If you look uh, in the middle there, there's a peak, there's several little small peaks there between the WCDM ch channels and the LTE channels. And here they're gone. Radio sitting in the same spot, or the antenna sitting in the same spot, but they're gone. Where, where did they go? These are. Anybody have any idea what those missing signals are? If you guessed GSM, that would be right. And so this uh, this screenshot is from before January first, twenty seventeen, and uh, this is after AT and T shut off their GSM. Um, RF knock offers. Uh, RFNOC version of Phosphor offers various shadings. So here's a, a few uh, views of those. Now this is the same center frequency, but instead of looking at 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth, we're now looking at 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth. And this would be at the, if we were to be streaming the 200 megahertz over to the host, that, that's at 6.4 gigabits per second, but even though that we're now doing this on RF knock, this is still at about four megabits per second. So it's possible to stream this over the internet. Um, so here's an example of a Wi-Fi channel. And you can see uh, some Bluetooth, I think, there are a mouse or something, uh, the little NFR 24 modules. So this is an example of the RF knock flow graph. Uh, starting with the radio block on the left, if you'll note, as Neil mentioned, the green lines that are in between the blocks indicates that that data is being transported on the FPGA between the blocks. So first, uh, we're bringing in, in this example, we're bringing in 200 megahertz off of the ADC, and then we're gonna go through a DDC, so it's the digital down converter. This is a decimation stage within the FPGA, so it's gonna bring it from a 200 megahertz rate down to a 50 megahertz rate. Then we run a, a win, an FFT windowing function, I think in this one we were running like a Blackman Harris. Next, we go through an FFT, which will uh, comp computate the uh, Fourier transform. Next it goes into the RF knock phosphor block. And this will actually take the, that vector of bins and generate the visualization. That's sent uh, through a couple FIFOs for buffering. Uh, also through a copy block once it's onto the host for additional buffering. And then on to the actual phosphor display block, which is what you actually see. And that's the, one of the only things that's running on the host. Uh, this could run on Raspberry Pi. And in comparison, if you want to take in a 200 megahertz sample stream, you need basically a high-end i7 CPU just to be able to keep up with it. This can run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so we're currently running the demo uh, here in Wireless Village to provide spectrum monitoring service for the wireless capture for light contest. There's a physical knob that is on the desk and Neil is gonna pick it up and hold it. You can come up and you can tune it around and if you press it, there's predefined frequency, so you can hop around to some interesting looking signals. Um, so right now we're looking at 2.4, and if you click it a few times, you'll hop around, you'll find the you know, 700 megahertz LT and various uh, signals. Come up and play with it, twist it. If you uh, press and hold it, it will adjust the gain, so you can turn the gain up and down right there. 
So in summary, RFNAC, we're trying to make FPG acceleration more accessible. This doesn't mean that if you don't, with an exception. HLS, with Vivaldo HLS, you're able to convert C and C++ into the VHDL or Verilog code. And, but if you don't know FPGA uh, Verilog or VHDL, there's still a uh, barrier of entry slightly. It's not a fully automated framework. Like you do have to understand a little bit about FPGA development. It's tightly integrated with GNU Radio, but you do not have to use GNU Radio. You can use it with uh, you know, C++ and pure UHD. <coughs> There's a built-in block or library of blocks uh, for OFDM, FFT, for filters, signal generator, the phosphor blocks. Those blocks are all portable between all the usurps. So if you develop something on an X300, with some slight modifications, possibly, you can port it to any other uh, system. Generally, if it works on one, it will work on all of them. Um, it's completely open source, as Neil had mentioned, so, and licensed under uh, LGPL, which means that you do not have to release your IP if you choose not to. Uh, we have a knowledge base that's at kb.es.com. There's a great getting starting guide. There's also a companion video, which will walk you through building your first RFNOC block. Um, just a little plug, there's a GNU radio conference coming up. It's in Las Vegas or in Henderson this year. Uh, we will be running three uh, four-hour workshops on RFNOC, which will completely go through, and you'll build your first FPGA image and run it. Um, we'd like to give an exceptional and a special thank you to, uh, first and foremost, Zero Chaos and Rick Melodic and the entire Wireless Village crew, the service that these guys provide is outstanding. It's pretty rare to find a group of people who are so dedicated and so thoroughly uh, interested in teaching the world about wireless security. As soon as you take your data off the line and you put it into the air, it's free for everybody to take. There's no, there's no security. You have to, and a lot of times, RF security is overlooked. Um, also, I'd like to thank the core RFNOC developers and architects, uh, Jonathan Pendlum and Dr. Dr. Uh, Martin Braun. They've, uh, they have architected and built this wonderful framework that is making it much easier for you to put your custom DSP into the FPGA. Um, thank you for coming. I appreciate everybody's attention. And that's it. Would you like to have any last words, Neil? Yeah.